most of us are in the rural area. Now, um, gestational diabetes screening and management. Uh, a study by Professor Kaushik and colleagues that looked at capacity and capability for testing blood glucose levels. They reported that it's done conditionally for few women who have symptoms. And the challenges are availability of the, the streets, uh, the skills, absence of glucometer, and so on and so forth. And the similar study reported presently, this is a systematic review uh, in Africa, which reported the barriers uh, to gestational diabetes screening, that is the health system related barriers, fashion related barriers, and societal level barriers. Now, the shortage of healthcare providers, logistics, knowledge and skills, limited opportunities for instance training, and then the patient related barriers such as insufficient knowledge of DPM, limited support from family and health providers, acceptability of the diagnostic tests, and some are societal barriers that um, some people also use traditional figures and customs and taboos about uh, the women body uh, to make. Now, whether universal or selective screening, as we show recommends universal screening, but due to the previous uh, various studies that I said, we tried to look at what if we do a selective screening. Then uh, some studies tried to look at it. One was I participated in one of the studies that uh, if we use the risk factors, the risk score. 64% of women uh, with TBM will be correctly diagnosed. And the study in South Africa reported more than 95%, Nigeria 85%, and Uganda 54%. And it was observed that selective screening missed uh, about 97% when glycosuria, glycosuria alone was used. And it missed 87% even when glycosuria like, was used. And it would be about 46 percent if only risk factors were used. And the studies um, that were uh, that, that, that tried to look at the uh, risk factors um, to determine the risk scores, they used different uh, risks. So it's really difficult to generalize because the different studies use different risk factors in their model. To determine whether they can uh, identify correctly the independent GDM or not. So, in summary, this is my last slide. Prevalence of GDM is increasing in the country, parallel with increasing overweight and obesity among women of reproductive age. Increased BMI was commonly noted as a risk factor. So, probably, preventing strategies on life cycle. Constitution to prevent overweight and obesity is necessary. Uh, GDM screening may be done in the government medical facilities. They use only during and even in the absolute of clinic. We don't have anywhere to see the blood glucose levels. And during the day, it's less than 5%. Um, Suboptimal management due to limited capacity and capability at the healthcare facilities. The Italian health system should be strengthened to improve the capacity. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Tamakajima. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to showcase what is going on in type 1 diabetes in the country. Um, my name is Edna Magnelio. I've introduced a uh, pediatric endocrinologist and working in the National Hospital.
So I'll be talking about type one in the Adventist and letters, and I'll be looking more at children and youth in type one in the Adventist. By definition, we've been talking about type four and um, diabetes mellitus. Uh, Mary has taken us through diabetes mellitus and um, type one diabetes as well. So I won't be talking much on the definition of type one. But when you talk about type one diabetes, it's sorry. Okay, it, it, it is generally a uh, deficiency in insulin. As a result of beta cell destruction. And in type 1, we have uh, an immune mediated type 1 and non immune mediated type 1. And most of the time, we call it idiopathic type 1 diabetes. Um, there are no causes of type 1, but they are associated factors with the genetic predisposition and environmental factors contributed. Uh, there are viral infections which are protective and viral infections which are protective, which predispose to type 1, then exposure to toxins and maternal nutrition may contribute to uh, development of type 1 diabetes in those in risk. Um, and on epidemiology, we talked about epidemiology, and but um, if you look here, about 72 million people with diabetes and um, diagnosed in Africa, and that includes children. And we have about 59 children in Africa with type 1 diabetes, but here we're talking about those who are less than 14 years. And uh, we're in from the Atlas, the Diabetes Atlas, the IA Diabetes Atlas. If you look around here, um, you see diagnosis in, um, in most of the African countries is less than five per uh, 100,000 population, which is uh, very low. So, is it very low or do not diagnose kids with type 1 or? Um, we're not sure what it is. I'm looking at the incidence comparing Africa and other countries. If you look at the Finland, which has the highest uh, type one population, and look at Tanzania, we are at 1.8 to 1.9 per 100,000 population. But most of our studies are in hospital. They're hospital based, and they're not uh, population based. So why the incidence is low, we think probably many are diagnosed, um, like how um, I gave an estimated about seven, seven out of 10 kids are, there, are diagnosed. And we have those diagnosis because most of us most of the time don't think of, about pediatric having diabetes. And there's high mortality, even those who are diagnosed, they die very fast. And uh, the studies to show low genetic risk in our drug African race. And our studies put out in hospitals, so we're missing those work um, in the community. And so, take one diabetes in Tanzania, what has been done, and what are the challenges where we are now? Um, in 2005, we never used to have pediatric clinics. So we started, we started pediatric clinics in 2005 in the village of hospital. But before that, there are children in Tech 1 that were missing adults, so we're missing them. But as you see, the number has been increasing. Um, this is in the before 1990s, and these are in the same time, so we're reaching. The incidence of 1.9. And these are the numbers we have. We are about 4,500 um, 4, or so. But these are the people, these are the kids we know. 
that those ones we don't show up in some way. Sorry for the busy slide, but um, this is how we started the dream. Uh, we had a support from Life of the Child, and that's where we started the first dream in the National Hospital. And after a few years, which is in 2007, we had five more sites um, by a different project, but they're both working with uh, the Ministry of Health. And with time currently, we have about 39 units with 4,000 and so kids. But with um, hand in hand with uh, the, the, the children, we also have trained healthcare providers, and these are the trainings we have so far from type one. So some of the outcomes of the trainings, and um, as you can see, we managed to reduce the um, number of uh, BK. BK is the commonest presentation and the severe form of type 1 diabetes, um, which is presented especially in areas where diagnosis is missed and the less diagnosis of type 1. So in 2005, about 90% were diagnosed in BK. But in 2018, those who were diagnosed in DKA were less than about 40, and in 2022, about 38. So we went down, we went down, at least reducing the number of DKA, and the number of children with um, type 1 diabetes in hospitals attending clinics is increasing. Um, which tells us that um, at least there's knowledge and awareness somewhere. So what is going on currently? We're expanding the services. The, so far, the 59 clinics and mostly the between the, uh, the national hospital, the regional hospital, the zonal hospital, regional and districts want to go further down to the health, uh, the health center. And we're trying to classify our uh, take point in Instagram. Because most of our kids, we're not sure they take one, take two, take one and a half. So we in between, we're not sure if all our kids are free to take one. Then we're looking at the incidents and of recent uh, we prepared a guideline for the management of take one and to be so we can be used. Um with all that we, we have challenges. Uh, we have general challenges and we have health um, capacity challenges and we have other challenges. So we have high mortality, we have lots of uh, follow up, we have poor glycemic control and poor psychosocial support. So these are the general challenges I'm, uh, I was talking about. We have very high rates of um, acute and chronic complications compared to other um, other countries or non-African countries. So why do we have these um, complications? We think because we're presenting our patients are presenting late, uh, there's no public awareness, so missing them, and there's myth about diabetes, and the common one is children don't uh, get diabetes. So, so people will never diagnose uh, diabetes in, in children, and this poverty, which is very difficult to, um, to tackle. But then there's healthcare providers themselves, sometimes they diagnose, they lack awareness, and uh, so as a result, we have mismanagement and complications of the management. Um, our kids uh, lack psychosocial support. There's no specific person to talk to them about um, psychosocial issues, especially the adolescent one and the young adults. And um, most of the time, when they be nurses and educators, the doctors were seeing them trying to talk to them, but we're lacking a specific person. And the families, they don't get that support because when they have their pets, uh, they send to the clinic and that is that, nobody takes care of them. 
And so there is no well laid structure on psychosocial support in, in our kids. Um, and when we have high levels of follow up, our sensitivity is very high as well as kids of the self close to follow up and leading to what we're seeing on social deterioration of uh, the control and high rates of complications. Where do you have that uh, as a tennis distance from that from the from where they're staying to the clinic, but then uh lack of access of insulin despite the insulin being provided free and there are no adolescent friendly clinics. Uh, we tried to make one in Mumbili, but it does not get picked. Then transfer of patients to other clinics and transition. All the patients that we transfer to transition to other clinics, most of them turn back to the clinic or they don't come to the clinic at all. Um, we know that our, our workload, the physician has a huge workload. So taking care of specific like for these kids is difficult. And also that the few few healthcare providers who really know and understand that it is in this age category. Um, these healthcare providers, despite the fact that their ages is rising. We still have uh, non communicable diseases, HIV, diabetes, I mean, HIV, TB, the North World, so diabetes has not replaced the non communicable, I mean, the communicable diseases. As a result, we have a double burden, and because communicable diseases are a cheap thing, it's not a chronic thing, so it's one type of thing that so people will take care of that, and because you've seen the results now, um, comparing to the uh, Communicable diseases, which is a long term uh, follow up, and our system was designed to take care of um, acute conditions rather than chronic conditions. Um, so, there are other challenges. Our kids get complications very early on during the disease, um, as early as one year after diagnosis. And so we're not sure is it care we're giving, we're not giving them enough care. Is it there an awareness so we miss even screening for complications? Do we have a different genetic makeup uh, which predisposes us to complications very early on? Or is it our diabetes is different and it is not type one? Because most of the type one, the complications take a longer time compared to type two and other types of diabetes. And we have inadequate epidemiological data on the prevalence of diabetes in children. So, what has been done so far? Uh, we've seen certain agreements, we've uh, established an agreement as public private partnership, where the Ministry of Health is working with other NGOs like Tanzania Diabetes Association, and we have. Um, we are educators and we are youth association. They're going around at least uh, giving education and awareness campaign, which helps um, in at least awareness that kids also get um, diabetes. The training and other initiatives, so different uh, means of health um, allows the sustainability because it is involved in the programs. And so it's easy to, to tackle a large uh, scale. Um, so there have been different efforts to train and retrain healthcare providers. We have different CMEs on diabetes. Now we have that guidance to come out. The uh, registry is underway. We started uh, making a registry for the kids, and there are more clinics underway. Uh, this is where we are, um, but this is uh, the health center at the Mopi National Hospital, and these are the kids getting um, education, and they here are at the camp and the youth, uh, this was a youth camp and education. Um, 
Thank you. To get I can achieve more, more awareness, more training, more data, and more research on type one diabetes. Thank you. So much. So uh, we have finished with the three presentations on the overall burden of diabetes. We have talked about that and one and GPA. So uh, are there any questions before we move on to the complications of diabetes? Any questions? Any clarifications? Please mention your name and your institution and who are you addressing the question. My name is uh, Collins. I just want to make a small comment on the gestation of the fetus. It is now known that one of the contributing factors is the bacterial dysbiosis. And this occurs because of several factors during pregnancy. And among them is uh, the increase of the anxiety and stress of pregnancy. And there are also the changes in the hormones. So if the spouse is severe, then you can get this uh, women going into the intestinal diabetes. Um, of course, uh, with the other factors contributing. And I Tend to believe also that perhaps this may also be contributing to the uh, uh, type 1 diabetes because uh, you read around the research to find uh, this versus which also cause uh, uh, changes in the immune response. So, perhaps is one of the factors that we think studies will uh, have to show on the the linkage between the and type 1 But also, as I mentioned, on the and treatment, sometimes the time is common factors. And a patient, for example, with hypertension, may be treated with diuretics, and this may cause the raising pressure. Now, when you are treating the uh, if it's hyperbilinear, uh, and this one also is a, a chance, there's a chance of this patient to be to a hyperglycemic attack. So that's all where my point is. Okay. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Lisara from Tanzania Diabetes Association, and my question goes to Dr. Pelina. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, I think on the last slide, she mentioned that the prevalence of GBM is increasing in terms of me. I wonder if it would be possible to understand the percentage rise of the increase as in probably which year to, from when to, to where we are today. So what is the percentage? But also, I wonder if it would also be um, ideal to understand uh, the region, prevalence by region, just to understand where is the value in terms of. Uh, Directing or various resources. Thank you. Uh, but you like to the question? Uh, thank you all for the questions. Uh, the first one was a comment. I think that is taken from the past minute. Uh, probably the area which needs to be explored further. Uh, question from Sala, prevalence is increasing. Um, our reference point was on this, the two studies that were done in the 90s, uh, which I'd say is zero percent. But then the current, the other studies that we have, which are around eight studies, you can't really tell the trend because they were concentrated on the almost at the same time and they were done in different different regions. But where we would say it's, it's higher prevalence, of course the study in the Doma shows a high prevalence, 
but then it's only a single study. So it's, it's difficult to generalize and, and say yes to the more with high prevalence. So probably we need more studies and data studies because this is just very small sample sizes that were conducted. All of them were below 600 women tested uh, while attending antenatal care. So maybe it's a gap that we need more data studies across the country so that we can really say the prevalence is this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, we move forward with the complications. Uh, most of the speakers are taking about 15 to 16 minutes, so I think we are to finish in time. I'd like to ask the speakers to cut down to uh, 12 minutes, please. Uh, uh, so our next speaker is what we call him as Mr. Foot. He's a diabetic food specialist, and he's Dr. Abbas. And Abbas is going to talk about diabetic food. Welcome. Thank you very much, Professor Koshi. Last one, I would like to ask Koshi Koshi to say that I need to talk some other people. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, just a, taking a thanks to all the organizers and to my team. Asia and Africa are the two largest continents in the world, and you can see that uh, we cater about 76% uh, of the population and the rest of the world 24. But we have the huge burden of 80% of diabetes. So uh, we definitely, what previous speakers have said, this goes very well with double burden we going to face. Look at the prevalence of Diabetes in Africa, where were we 20 years ago? And after 20 years, last year, 24 million, and next 20 years, we are going to live in diabetes. And that's not a nice thing to do, uh, to live with diabetes. Further, other regions, and we're the highest 134% raise in Africa. So the question is, what are we doing wrong? That why we are getting such a huge number of diabetes? Obviously, when you have more diabetes, so more complications, and you've already heard, what I'm going to talk is on diabetic food. <coughs> diabetic food complications, as already mentioned, there's a worldwide increase in diabetes, so thoroughly there will be increase in diabetes complications, and one of these complications, the dreadful complication, the food complications, which would be a major public health problem, many cause of prolonged hospitals, cause definitely won't be sustainable. And in our setups in the underdeveloped country, commonly we have an infectious geology with underlying peripheral neuropathy and arterial disease. If you take the epidemiology uh, all over the world, approximately 50% of all diabetic sustained ulcers uh, in their lifetime, across the globe, 40 to 50% of diabetics end up with amputations. 50% of mortality in those people who will sustain amputation in five years. And all this can be prevented. 85% of diabetic problem if the approach is proper. So, gangrene and infections are the top cause of amputations. Two prevalence in our setup, whether Africa or Asia, will always remain underestimated because we never know what is happening in rural areas. Published reports have always said delay amputation, delay presentation is the main cause of amputation. And most of the patient who need amputation does not even reach to the, the eye before even surgery. Back in 2005, we estimated that uh, uh, Bill Foods International we estimated that uh, every 30 seconds there was an amputation somewhere in the world. So if it's one, two in one minute, and 120 in one hour. That means anywhere in the world. Then it was also quoted the same year in Lancet on the front page. Every 30 seconds, somewhere rolling is lost with diabetes. Then in 2017, we set again and we estimated that it has actually gone to 20 seconds. So now it is three in a minute. So all these conferences, seminars, all the meetings, workshops, hands on experience, uh, and the things are getting dead to us. So, the education now is every 20 seconds, it means three 
in a minute or 180 in an hour, somewhere in the world. Diabetic foot infection cannot be taught without the common problem of diabetes. This was a study where it was done in the five countries and we were given a hypothetical case. Uh, so it was in North America, South America, in Asia, two colleagues from Asia, India, and China, and myself in, in Africa. And we're going to talk about Tanzania, which is 167 ranked country, and the average income uh, GDP, GDP per capita is 1,500 US dollar. If you look at it, uh, let, let's not talk about other countries, but we are lowest from other countries to compare. And this was a hypothetical case we were given to the cement this course. We are still to treat this case is 3,500, 3,000 US dollar. Compared to others, it's well more, but it is approximate 25 months salary of their bread earner. So in an extended family, what we have in Asia and Africa, what one person is earning and the other eight to ten are depending on him. And if a bread earner is not earning, that's a huge uh, burden to a uh, a family community and a nation as, as well. Let's just go, I won't talk everything, but the complex interplay of various factors, peripheral neuropathy, arterial disease, mixture of neighbors, peripheral and arterial disease, new skin infections, biomechanics of the food, social, economic, and culture factors, non assertive lesions, and health welfare, healthcare workers. These are all complex interplay of various factors. The peripheral neuropathy, if you look at where we live in Tanzania, in 1992, the estimated rate was 25%. Now it has virtually gone to an 80%. And it's remains a major underlying risk factor up till now for an ulcer and infection in our sector. And if you look at in the West, it's a similar from 5 to 80%. And we are no more less than a Western country, whether in Tanzania or in the Nigeria, 84%. And these are the major underlying risk factors for ulcers and infection. Do a literature review and you find all the double digits around 70-80% wherever you are in Africa in the last 30 years. So peripheral neuropathy has been recursed in the last 20 to 30 years in this high and it is the major uh, risk for the diabetic foot ulcers and infections. This is uh, the rodent bite ulcers where it's a severe form of neuropathy where a patient cannot feel the nibbling of the red bites where they, uh, they are given uh, free of charge which is to the rodents and the patient himself or herself does not realize it. Look at the for neuropathy in this 91% and arterial disease was 31%. Red rate was 9%. Chalcot neuropathy, we never used to see it a few years back, but it is becoming an emerging public health problem for Africa. It is not diagnosed, usually the lead to diagnosis with the cellulitis and it is treated as that. We did a study in Tanzania, 18% of chalcot food with ulcers are presented, and it's at, at, at the time they present, it's almost disorganized food, and in the same rates were, came, were coming from Uganda and Egypt, around 12 to 18%. There's both peripheral arterial disease. Peripheral arterial disease is now increasing in Africa. It's associated with increased urbanization. Rates vary, of course, but the trend wherever you are in Africa is going up, and the examples are that it's increasing. Look at this. If you do a literature review in Africa, uh, peripheral, all of them are double digits. Where we are actually from South Africa, almost like we are in the comparison with Western world. So uh, we are actually developing to the cost of health. And look at this, another 10 past 10 years, same way, but in the 1990s, where were we? Single digit. What happened suddenly? Wherever in Africa, we were in single digit, and it was like non-existent. Back in 2000, early 2000, we did this study comparison of the three countries, pure Caucasians, Africans, and Asians, and you see, Therefore, the law that wherever you are in the world, it was sent 80%. But peripheral uh, arterial disease, which was very high in Caucasians, less in Africans and Asians. But now that's not the story, it has changed. Let's look at the other risk factors analysis. Current clinical quality of mortality among patients with food ulcers. 
And this is the, you can see this type 2, 88%, peripheral neuropathy in this study, 80%, and arterial disease, 28%, 37%. The Characteristics 24% had a liver ischemic lesions, 44% with mindful vascular disease, 21 underwent amputation because of lead presentation, Wagner 4 or more, and overall mortality in this was 11%. What was the uh, reason of mortality? PAD was on top, liver ischemic failure of access to hit, Wagner score, lead presentations, 4 or more than that, mindful vascular complication, and all these people. We ended up with amputation. So, a new reality in arterial disease is now playing a major role in the prevalence of foot ulcers. Neuroschemic is also significantly affecting the ulcer healing, and ulcer size rather than sepsis was a predictive of ulcer healing. Let's look at it, the uh, ethnicity, a contrast between African and Asian patients in our setup. This is the similarity seen in both African and Asian. And where I have had it, the age, duration of diabetes, seeking medical attention, no, no, nothing was different. They were all the same. And in fact, this was not there before. Peripheral arterial disease, now it's almost not significant. The same in arterial, peripheral neuropathy was the same. And neuroschemic also in this population was similar and not significant. What was predominant in African patients was type 1, body mass index was less, high fasting blood glucose. Lead presentations in gangrene and selected for measuring amputations. Whereas the predominant in Asians, they had a history of stroke, ischemic heart disease, family history of diabetes, microvascular disease, previous as the smokers with a high uh, BMI. So, for both ethnicity group, it's a uh, Gross uh, ethnicity group mortality rates were significant higher in those people with peripheral arterial disease versus without peripheral arterial disease, and those persons which did not heal. Time is tissue in diabetic foot. This is a new term which is called diabetic foot attack. It is similar to what we have. We have heard about heart attack and stroke. So, time is tissue. These are the people where the time is not tissue and they have been delayed due to whatever reason is this. And the common reason which we find typical sequential time notification decision to seek medical help, patient first would start treatment at home. So herbal bath, use of reversal blood, cutting the callosity, that is a uh, bathroom surgery. Then they will start going to a herbal or a fat healer tradition. Then by that time when it is fed, then they will go to the primary health center, then they will go to the district regional health center, by the time they reach to the referral hospital, it is even difficult to save a life in the heart and a foot. So let's see to the outcome hospital admissions for diabetic foot patients in the other population. This is a study done that 15% of the patients admitted in our setup have foot ulcers, 33% underlying amputations. And 54% mortality in those people who presented leg, partner four or more, and overall mortality in this was 27%. The similar, the, if you break down uh, why, what was according to the Wagner classification, that means if it is below gangrene and above gangrene, then we see that the, uh, the below grade for neuroschemic reasons were less or more than Wagner four was more, there were more here neuroschemic, they ended up with the amputation. And the main cause, the delayed presentation. It was significant. Similar study also on the northern part of the country, and you can see high rates of amputations and mortality rates. So, the mortality rates still remains high despite the surgery. Surgery undertaken during less severe space may improve the patient's outcome, and delayed presentation has been the major risk factor for poor outcome. And this is the story everywhere in Africa, if you do a literature review, high rates of amputations. So wherever you are in Africa, this is the past 10 years literature review. Social economic factors, we still have to finish with this. Look at this, barefoot walking, our farmers are still walking there after all telling them bathroom surgery when they start treatment at home to not proper footwear. This guy telling the patient to see this guy, these are actually, I'm not right, but he's actually advertising 
treating the calluses, bones, and, and he is always competing with us. The fat healers and others. This is a patient who was told that if you put this your uh, wife's hair, the infection will not spread. And in the end, what happened? Wife lost all the hairs, and the poor patient lost the food. This is a patient came with a gum mixed with aspirin, and he was being suggested by fat healers. Then we have this, uh, you know, all these um, herbal medications, rodent bites. So all these things, lack of awareness among the patients, and that's all this, we have a huge work to be done at the primary health center. Normal cervical pathology of food ulcers. These are, these are because there is no media person there, isn't it? This is because of us. So when the patient here, obviously we cannot blame ourselves. We are so busy, so many patients. And when the patient comes with a careless, we don't even check if there is a careless. This is an emergency, it has to be taken care. This patient with a careless here will do the prayers or common infections, common infections. You see all the dry skins and cracks has to be taken care of same time. Why a patient has to reach with this gross deformity of nerves? All these hypertrophic nerves, this is a tradition. All this has to, if they come routinely to our uh, clinics or uh, diabetes spirits, can be taken and you can save more mortality and mortality, save the food and the life. Evaluation and intervention. Most of the problems are preventable through early identification and prompt treatment by a very simple skilled health professionals. In Africa, education is the only powerful tool which we have for the patient free of charge. Due to lack of basic education and also can go to um, uh, medication or even we can miss the, uh, lose the patient, we need education program targeting at the primary health centers. And it is also important who is educating who, because if an educator starts giving the wrong information, holding a book upside down, then the information further out would be will not go down. So otherwise we have to start using, we start using our things upside down. Basic things in a clinic, what you have to do is, but we have to have a system. I know we see a lot of patients in the clinic, 60, 70 patients, of them, but if there is no, it's a normal diabetic food, grade zero, annual checkup is okay. There is no neuropathy, no complications. General information is okay. If it is grade one, that means every six months there is a neuropathy of arterial disease, then no previous ulcers or indication, then every six months examination is okay. If a patient has all peripheral arterial neuropathy or a deformity, then every three months. But if a patient has sustained a previous amputation or an ulcer, then this is a high risk for intensive food education. One in three months has to be done. Several, one of, several studies have been done and have been successful. One of these studies was a step by step which was piloted and carried out in Tanzania. This program showed that ulceration, infection, and new medications potentially can be prevented. This is a patient who came almost BK, for BKA. Uh, so step by step food project, several step by step food projects were done started in 2003 with a uh, generous sponsorship from World Heritage Foundation, thanks to that. And uh, in 2014, 2012, all the several step-by-step -step food projects were done. And I'm going to detail at this 12 to 15 minutes, but let's see the effectiveness of step-by-step. -step. Entire period between 2001 to 2008, it was at 17.6 at the left of hospital. Before step by step, it was very high. And then there was a slight speak in 2005 after step by step. And then the, the rate started reducing and the referral to the uh, referral hospitals. So it was a peak slightly here due to step by step after 2004 was. So it was seen that food problems were being picked up faster and the food losses were declining. Same way, the yield process were far fast, hard, and more compared to total amputations. Several food projects were done. Even then, they were imported. One of the uh, idea was to import uh, to, to, to export outs, uh, outside uh, Tanzania. And 15 countries were, were done in Africa. Uh, and, and then they also there was demand coming from outside. So 
uh, we said that we cannot go to each and every country and maybe it was turning to a trend as well, trends, trends of course, and where we targeted the regions then. So the first food trend, the food trend of course was where we South America, Brazil, the 13 countries got together and so on. It also went to Europe, Western Pacific, French speaking countries in Africa and MENA region. So six kind of food trend of course. Very proud that this unique course model was started in, di uh, di uh, in, the, in, in diabetic food in Tanzania as a pilot project and has been exported to several countries. First, it was in developing country, then went to the second world, and then even 17 countries in Europe. So at the moment, this has been implemented in 112 countries around the world, and we are the one who started it in Tanzania. Very proud of that. Thank you. Just uh, two, three months back, we had another uh, grant from World Diabetes Foundation and we managed to do uh, this uh, uh, training national diabetes food project to reduce the lead amputation among the people with diabetes in Tanzania, to build the capacity among the healthcare workers in food diabetes food care, and to, to give them a, a, a basic toolkit for diabetes food care. Uh, in collaboration obviously uh, TDA and Brian. And there were 156 attendees with all the uh, specialties were there. Three the workshops in, in World War III in variety courses. And, uh, and we actually took over the hospital and all the theaters uh, conducted at the Nazimodia Hospital all day. So it was uh, a successful and the, the message went to all this region, which was the whole district and region, thanks to all the Diabetes Foundation. In the end, if I have given you too much information and now you lost which way to go, then please, can you get up after I know we have a heavy lunch to just a few couple of slides. Take home message how to prevent food problems. Regular inspection and examination of the clinic when the patient comes to the clinic. Identification of the high risk food. I've already talked which is the high risk food. Education of the patient's family health care workers should work. Appropriate of the food where here we should not forget the patient. The focus should be on the whole of the patients, not the hole in the patient. So the food is part of food where the part of it we should examine it. Treatment of non arthritic pathology. This depends on us, we should not miss it. In conclusion, efforts are still required to increase awareness of diabetes and its complication among the healthcare workers and patients. Early detection and treatment of diabetes will improve the course of disease and reduce morbidity and mortality. This is my last slide from a two great people from two continents, from Asia, Mark Manhattan. He said, if you have to live as you were to die tomorrow, so you can live as if you were to die tomorrow, but if you have to run, educate yourself as if you are going to live forever. And another brethren from Africa, he said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And he showed us, he showed us when we were there, life we saw it. And I would say that education is the only powerful tool we have it in the European world, which is free of charge for the patient and effective if it is implemented properly. Thank you very much. Can I invite uh, Dr. Kishen uh, Mistry, is a specialist of technologies, uh, working at the Human Hospital, and working quite a lot on diabetes psychopathy. He's going to uh, make a presentation on uh, diabetes psychopathy and the situation in Tanzania. Thank you. I give this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers for the satellite symposium on diabetes 360 and all the organizers as well. Diabetes uh, and diabetic retinopathy. First of all, the whole presentation on complications of diabetes, uh, diabetes and the other complications of the story of impact. On, on the society and on medical personnel so that we can do something to prevent them from happening in the first place. So I'll be taking you to 
the session on diabetes retinopathy, which is also an important component when in dealing with patients with, who are living with diabetes in this world. As, as we all know, uh, eye is a very small organ, but it is very important to see. Without sight, you do not do anything in this world. So there's a huge impact when we, when we talk on social economic status and diabetes. So diabetes, as many of my colleagues uh, say, that is one of the most prevalent entities that imposes a significant impact on health systems. It can affect every system of the body, be it microvascular, macrovascular, and non-vascular complications are related to it. And diabetes retinopathy being the most common uh, microvascular complication of diabetes mellitus. And as I mentioned, it's the leading cause of visual loss in working age groups. <coughs> Previous colleagues of mine already mentioned this. I do not need to go into details, but in 2021, the idea reported 537 million people to have diabetes, and of which 24 million people live in the African region. And by 2045, this is approximated to be around 55 million. We are one of the 48 countries in the IDF African region. So, estimates of the global prevalence of diabetic retinopathy and projection of burden to 2045 reported that in 2020, we had about 103 million population of people having diabetic retinopathy, of which it is about expected to rise to about 160 million. Uh, Africa being the most uh, prevalent with the figure of 35.9%, which is quite high as compared to the other countries across the globe. There have been quite a few number of studies uh, reported in Tanzania on the prevalence of diabetic technology. So a few of them to mention here are a study done in the northern region, the Majaro, uh, which reported the prevalence of about 27.9%. If you can note that this was between the year 2010 and 2014, a little while back. Recent ones that were done were in Mwanza between June and August 2017, where prevalence of diabetic retinopathy was reported to be around 42.9%. And in Dar es Salaam between June and December 2015, prevalence of diabetic retinopathy was reported to be around 56.5%. What's important to note here is that as the years are progressing, if the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy is increasing uh -huh. with time. This is some data that I have from the hospital in Paris now. Uh, we have a number of patients that have been increasing uh, with diabetic retinopathy presenting to our clinic. So like in 2019, we had about 686 patients who had presented with diabetic retinopathy. And if we look ahead in 2021, last year, we had about 842 patients with diabetic retinopathy. So we see the number is increasing. The trend is going towards a, a bad curve, and we are going in, in a bad area. I did a bit of percentage on the laser treatment that we, we did at, at our, our setting. So in the year 2019, we had about 15.7% of patients who had diabetic retinopathy underwent laser treatment, whereas in 2021, about 26.8% of patients underwent laser treatment. This is very important to note. The more complications that we have for diabetes, like diabetic retinopathy, the more complicated diabetic retinopathy, the more expensive the treatment is. The cost of this treatment is a major impact on, on, the, on the social economic life of a patient. As, as we all know, Laser is, you might all not know, laser treatment is very costly. When we talk about Tanzania, the laser, average laser treatment can cost anywhere between 200,000 up to 700,000 shillings, which for a normal individual, it is very expensive. We talk about percentage of intraocular injections given per year in our city. So patients who presented to us Previously, the 20, year 2019, having diabetic retinopathy, we had about 5.9% of patients underwent uh, these, these injections. And in the year 2021, that percent has increased almost to twice, up to 9.3%. Here again, I would like to stress upon these intraocular injections. What are these intraocular injections that I'm talking about? These are the anti-EGFs that we use 
to patients who are having diabetic macroedema, a complication, a science strategy complication that needs to be discovered early in its time so that to prevent it and its treatment is very costly. An average injection that, we, that is required to treat diabetic macroedema, a single injection can cost anywhere between 200,000 up to 1.5 million Tanzanian children, depending on the on the on the on the, the grade of uh, injection or the generation of the injection, as we speak. The first generation is the this this that is about 20,000, and the most expensive one is the third generation, the fourth generation, which can cost anywhere between 1.5 to 2 million Tanzanian children. And mind you, this is just one, not one injection therapy; it may require the patient to have three, four, six injections, depending on the stage that the patient is presenting with. So imagine if a patient had to undergo about six injections, he would have to pay more than eight to 10 million in order to get this treatment done. So it is very expensive. So one of the factors that are, are associated with diabetic retinopathy, we have non-modifiable risk factors, we have modifiable risk factors. What we are here for, is to manage these modifiable risk factors. We can all do this together. Alone, it's not possible. The non-modifiable ones are duration of diabetes, as we all know, the genetic factors, pregnancy. But the modifiable ones are the diabetic control, the glycemic uh, control. If we put down the HDA1C to less than 7% in our patients, then the risk of getting diabetic retinopathy automatically reduces. Effective control of blood pressure, lipid levels, and lifestyle modification, which is very important. All my patients that come to the clinic setup, the three most important things that I always stress upon is lifestyle modification, taking your medicines at time, and exercising. These are very important things that you need to talk to your patients as well. Now, a bit on pathophysiology before I move on to the important impact of this, this lecture. Is that what is the pathophysiology? So diabetic retinopathy is a microvasculopathy. We all know that there are there are things that occur in this vasculopathy. This lateral capillary occlusion, as similar to other vessels in the body, we have the lateral capillary leakage that happens in this. So as a result of the occlusion, the microvascular occlusion, so we have retinal hemorrhages that take place in the retina. We have the axillary formation due to the leakage, and this is these things eventually lead to the complications of diabetic retinopathy and eventually lead to blindness, which I'll talk to you I'll talk to you about in the further slides. So when we talk about symptoms, usually diabetic retinopathy is asymptomatic, and patients when they do present with those symptoms, they might have reached very far ahead in this. So they may present with blurring of vision, low there's fluctuating vision, distorted vision, impaired color vision. They may present even with partial or total loss of vision. It is very difficult to see in this like, conditions, but probably I, I'll just mention here, this is a normal retina. This is a photograph of a normal retina where you can see the optic disc. This is the microvasculature. We have the artery and the veins. And this is the central part of the retina. This, that's uh, macular. So when we talk about diabetic retinopathy, we have the background diabetic retinopathy and the sites threatening ones. So I'll take you through these images, not to scare you, but to open your eyes to what's happening inside the eye. Because I believe ophthalmologists are the only individuals who can see the bodies inside. What's happening? How diabetes can affect the eyes. So let me show you what exactly happens. So when we're talking about non proliferative Mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we're talking about microaneurysms. So basically, there are small microaneurysms forming inside this, uh, around these blood vessels, and these are the ones that eventually will cause leakage. We have the moderate type of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, where we have retinal hemorrhages, we have hard excellence, these are leakage of fluid from the blood vessels, we may have microaneurysms. So as this disease or the complication progresses, we tend to see a, 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 a poorer picture of the retina with time. When we talk about severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, there is a lot going on inside the retina. We have functional spots, we have the green venous bleeding, as you can see, we can have retinal hemorrhages, we can have areas of dot and dot hemorrhages, exudates. So, 
like the entire geography of the retina changes as this complication progresses. Then we have the proliferated type of diabetic retinopathy. This is a monster indeed when we talk about diabetic retinopathy and its complications. So there are new blood vessels formation. Now, retina is one of the tissues inside the body that is uh, requiring perfusion, enough perfusion so that it can perform its, its work and it can, it can give you vision. It comes a point whereby the blood perfusion is too compromised and the retina is scheming in all areas and therefore it, it signals the brain that it's not able to perform its daily functions and in return vasoendothelial growth factor hormones are released and that makes these new blood vessels which are actually causing this threat to our vision. This, this patient with this fundus photograph may or may not have vision. That's the view. There's another photo, uh, photograph, fundus photograph of a sub highlight image. This is the result of this new blood vessel formation. This is exactly happening uh, right in front of the macular area. So this patient may have a light perception, vision, and which requires urgent treatment. Another complication of uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy is the formation of these fibrovascular membranes. So this fibromuscular membrane, this is a risk factor for a retinal detachment. This is the one that can cause complete detachment of the retina and that's an leading to blindness. So all in all, diabetic retinopathy, complications for it, end result of it is blindness. So we need to do something about it so that this things do not happen. This is an image of a fractional retinal detachment. This is this fold of retina that you're seeing is a retina that has detached and come overlapping the area of the retina. So, this is an OCT image of the retina. The OCT is an important tool for ophthalmologists in order for us to see the presence and absence of a diabetic macular edema, which is related to diabetes as a complication. So, this allows us to see all the 10 layers of the retina, starting from the most, most uh, uh, photoreceptor layer up to the anterior cell layer and the cell layer. So, this is a normal image of the retina. If you compare this, this is the central part of the retina, and this is the fovea. If you compare this image with the image that I'm projecting here now, this is diabetic activity. This means these small elliptic spaces, these are these are fluid within the retina cell. This is this patient may or may not have a very, very good vision. And the outcome of this depends on the phase that the patient presents with. If the patient presents within the six months period of having this edema, then the better chances of the patient recovering is vision. Else, the vision, uh, the vision will, will drop and the patient may not be able to recover this vision if not treated time. When we talk about management of diabetic retinopathy, we have different management guidelines. This is actually from the guidelines, the current guidelines of 2018 of Tanzania on managing the diabetic retinopathy, whereby we have either no or background diabetic retinopathy. The important aspect here is to counsel that comes in the patient control the blood pressure and blood glucose and the other risk factors and see the patient within six and nine months period. The other area is the CPA and proliferative type of diabetic retinopathy, whereby we do have to provide them with scatter laser. Previously, the basis of severe and proliferative type of diabetic retinopathy, we just used to observe them and counsel them. But recent studies have suggested it's better to give them laser therapy rather than waiting for a proliferative type of diabetic retinopathy occurring. And in the proliferative type, we have laser therapy, we have chop injections, we have the surgery, depending on the type of uh, complication that a patient has presented to. This is an image of uh, laser retina uh, following the laser therapy. So the white areas are the hyperpigmented area. This, this photograph is probably from uh, post two weeks of laser. Eventually, these white lesions will turn into hyperpigmented areas of the retina. That those are the retinal scars eventually. And this is what actually we want to achieve so that we are able to save the central part of the retina because this is the area that, that needs to be saved so the patient can preserve his vision. This is a photo of uh, intraocular injections, how we give intraocular injections. So intraocular injections are very important for bleeding vessels, for macular edemas, 
and other methodologies that require to save the patient from these complications. Now, this is an important area which I would like to stress one more with this discussion. Different levels of damage clinics and what are the respective tasks? What can we do to prevent these things from happening? Now, every one of us are responsible for preventing these things from happening. And each one of us should take up as a task and do this. So at a primary level, when we're talking about the primary level, I am talking about the district hospital. And secondary level, I'm talking about the regional hospitals, and the tertiary level, I'm talking about probably the national or referral hospitals. So primary level, what can we do? This is the main area where we can work on. So primary area, we need to screen these people, we need to catch these people. These diabetic patients who are coming to us on a daily basis, we need to get hold of them and screen them for diabetic retinopathy. If they're told they do not have diabetic retinopathy, they can be counseled and then followed up carefully. If they're told they are found with diabetic retinopathy, then they can be treated or they can be referred to a secondary level. At a secondary level, we need to have a complete, a comprehensive ophthalmic unit that does the complete treatment for the diabetic retinopathy. If at all there are extra things that need to be done, such as the retinal surgery, which can be found in the tertiary level, then they can be referred to the tertiary center. So when I'm talking about the primary level of diabetic clinics, I meant to talk about the district hospital. So what exactly do we need? So we need very few tools. All we need is human resources, such as either an ophthalmic nurse, an assistant medical officer who is probably trained in ophthalmology, and a few of these tools, such as the blood pressure machine, height and weight skills, EHR, and probably are not the most common. So if they are properly trained, we can get enough patients from these centers and prevent them from getting the complicated types of diabetic retinopathy. A simple history taking, a simple visual angle taking, and a retinal examination can do a lot. And this is an area that can, can get hold of so many patients that we're missing on in this country. Secondary area where we have the comprehensive evaluation of the eyes, you may need an ophthalmologist there, an optometrist there, and you can also have this ophthalmic nurse and an assistant medical officer. And this is where we do the comprehensive testing through the slit plan. The slit plan is a, is a tool that we use to see the retina. Fundus camera, an OCT scan that we talked of, an eye ultrasound uh, unit, and a laser unit that will help to treat the patient with diabetic retinopathy. In tertiary uh, diabetic clinic, such as the national hospital, such as ours as the National Hospital, we need to have more comprehensive here. The only thing that's added here is the presence of retinal specialist, a rich retinal surgeon, the presence of low vision therapists. Now, you'll be surprised in the entire of this country, there are about three to four vitro retinal surgeons. Of with a population of about 65 million. This is quite a low number. The numbers are low because the total number of ophthalmologists in the country itself, active ophthalmologists, are 84 number to 65 million people population. So the numbers are quite low, but still we can do something about it. Important thing to note during screening with patients with diabetes mellitus, we should not forget about the hypertension, the kidney disease. The dyslipidemias, the diabetic food, as Dr. Bas mentioned, looking at the neuropathies, diabetic retinopathy, and nutrition. This is also a very important aspect. Uh, one of the colleagues presented about it, and we really need to stress on this because whatever we eat reflects in our bloodstream. So, nutrition is very important. Counseling there is very important. So, diabetic retinopathy is preventable through strict glycemic control annual screening of all patients with diabetes by ophthalmologists or diabetic retinopathy screeners. The reason for me to mention this thing here, diabetic retinopathy screeners, is that there is an initiative put by the UMAS eye department currently that uh, yeah, they are training these screeners so that the, uh, the hospitals across here, the message here is to bring in more uh, this, this, this personnel, it doesn't need to be an ophthalmologist, either an assistant medical officer or an ophthalmic nurse. 
can be brought here, can be trained on how to screen these patients using these simple tools. And then they can go back to where they are working at the workstation and get hold of these patients at an early stage so that we can do maximum for these patients. Thank you very much. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Tachi Sohani. I want to start to make my dad with the doctor's previous gift in the beginning of cardiology. So, cardiology. Thank you, Dr. Tachi. I'm sure this is the cause of the presentation. I appreciate that I don't want to away from the cardiologists because when we be sent and we get a presentation, we find out about the presentation that is. African vascular in such a way that instead of doing the actual policy for the Jewish, the Bible was the Jewish, the Jewish was the Jewish, the Jewish was the Jewish, the Jewish was the Jewish. The American Heart Association, the one of its meeting, gave up this very important statement. That from the point of view of the cardiovascular disease, it's appropriate to say diabetes is cardiovascular disease. Because when you look at the majority of the population that are treated, the patient who have diabetes, they are actually the vascular diabetes, given the way they follow the pathology and dealing with the diabetes patient, we need to focus more on This is already mentioned by the people because I want to be heard. I don't want to go into details of that. But it is important to say that the number of patients with diabetes is increasing. And with each um, advancing years, the number of patients is increasing. And this increase is more markedly due to low income countries. And all of that type of diabetes comes from the majority of patients with diabetes. About 90% of the patients with diabetes are with type 2. And it's actually postulated that in every, out of every 11 others, one patient will be able to 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 be able to
the Christmas for the Quran to exist. Quran is an important part to predicate AI as compared to the normal population. Just a few weeks ago, we saw at the night of the paper where the eight year old young man made a mark of this topic. What does that tell us? It tells us that when you do that, it is the chances of the computation that the people will have with advanced leaders are much more aid. So we need to make various interventions and this point the most of the ideas or the better computation as most of the colleagues have just indicated. But we all know that the ethics was both by Professor and Professor Education. And the process of this was if you compare between the diabetic person and the non-diabetic person with much more accelerated advanced and improved practice process and practice. And it's also important to know that we have um, a diverse map of these factors, but we also include a diverse factors. So we make a sharing of these factors between the cardiovascular and the diabetes. So that when you extrapolate, that tells us that in patient diabetes, we tend to be much more severe disease, many more complications as compared to the normal uh, person. There have been this very lot of cardiometabolic effect where the interplay of various factors, or the interplay of the interleukin, the cytokine, the malignancy factor, which all come to lead to the most of the complications that we see in the majority of patients, the cardiovascular complications that we see in the majority of the patients. I'll touch briefly on two aspects and three diabetes and hypertension. Diabetes and coronary uh, disease, and diabetes and hypertension. Hypertension will affect around 30% of the patient with diabetes, and type 2 diabetes is often, in hypertension, in type 2 diabetes is often present as a part of the metabolic system, but in patients with type 1, they tend to have hypertension as a complication of diabetes performance. And you mm -hmm. know that hypertension is a pressure increase. Uh, the risk of both macro and diabetic complication. I participate in uh, an increased risk of some diabetic specific complications, such as the genetics of the fever. And in most of the studies recently, they have demonstrated that if you effectively control your blood pressure, you have an effective control of hypertension among diabetes, then you tend to reduce the level of complication. This was one of the studies which showed that if you can implement your communication of systemic radiation, you have between that normal mass and the diabetes, you have a twice increased risk of dying from the cardiovascular related cause. So if you have a diabetic patient with a non diabetic and with um, an increase in systemic radiation, then each um, then to increase risk of dying from the cardiovascular disease. Telling us that if you take a good control of that patient, then it will just be reducing the risk of that cardiovascular disease. We know that when we talk about uh, hypertension, we need to get a lifestyle and get this lifestyle modification in the pharmacological trial. So, when these different lifestyle modifications, these different lifestyle changes may actually give you a reduction in the amount of systemic dilation as for the different variety. Uh, in weight reduction, reduction in salt, uh, using a dash diet, the amount of alcohol that you take, and not smoke. For my fellow clinician, I went away from the rest of the, the group. For the human clinician, this might not be practical, uh, not be practical. But we know there are some medications which are advocated, there are some levels which, when you take that level, get that in that so we usually start with hypertension for the patient with the people and it is recommended that the target blood pressure should should um factor the medication to the target of around one target systolic and probably the diastolic not 
treatments that describe the symptoms of patients uh, with the condition called the pegaloid part, which is a urinary disorder and progressively obesity, gradually to incontinence, and also patients who are presenting with testing, reflexuria. Some of them may have losing consciousness and others develop TB. And those conditions actually they are TB in the end. The, the, the condition which is called the genomic part is DNA, and it was linked with the TB. So it's not new. And uh, recently, we see that the DNA cases are increasing, as we have already observed from the speakers, and TB is highly endemic in our settings. Now, individuals with DNA, they are to increase the risk of getting blood and TB. Means if someone is infected and uh, the mycobacterium TB may inhale, the risk of getting Russian TB is high and it's up to 16, above 60%. Whereas the risk for developing uh, disease from Russian TB to Africa, uh, TB disease, the risk is more than 3.5%. And currently, from this uh, Lancet Global Health Report, we see that the prevalence of DNA in the TB patients is around 15%. In other settings, it's up to 36%. But in Africa, it's exactly 8%, uh, ranging 6 to 10%. So we see the, the Africa trend for DM is increasing quickly, also with the rest of individuals, because you see there is a change of age structure. The, the lifespan of this continent is uh, lengthening, and also there are some modifications of that. We are some of you see some of the westernized food, and more people, the more population is in this urban areas. So these are the risk factors for DNA. However, the risk, the, the, the TB incidences, it is going slowly down. We are supposed to have to do advantage, but the speed is not adequate. Now the concern here is the convergence of TB in the DNA epidemic, and it may replace what we see, particularly in TB. Uh, that is associated with complications. Someone with the DMH, they get to be, they accelerate the complications. They mark all micro vascular complications exacerbated. Uh, and what we see generally, we see that the effect of DM in TB death, this is a, uh, from the reviews, it's too cold. I know in one side the it was quite common, but generally these are the global uh, meta systematic review and meta analysis. Then the risk is too cold. And the effect of him on death and the treatment failure combined is approximately it's around 70 percent compared to those without being. And the effect of GM in the uh, microbiological evidence. Uh, it's around two fold. Because the TV we usually monitor patients at my own three, and they find that these patients need um, extended treatment. And the risk for developing much blindness and TV, which is a complicated form of TV, it's also two fold. There is this guideline which was coming. Um, Low and middle income countries to integrate to be in the diabetes readiness. And um, we are supposed to start since 2011, but until today, things are not very, are not running small. And uh, specific to Tanzania, <coughs> the burden of DMA TB is supposed to be compared to uh, 
uh, settings and mortality, as I described before, and this was a report from once on that uh, individuals with TB and D, the risk of dying is five times compared to those without TB. And mortality occurred uh, in the first three months, so early mortality is an issue. Therefore, we have these two issues that we can in the early mortality of individuals with TBDM in our country. Uh, it, um, I emphasize that perhaps program, programmatic factors are the reasons of this high rate of mortality, but also some biological factors may contribute. With the programmatic factors, we understand these diseases are managed. Silo, uh, integration has not started, and this delays uh, the interventions uh, of both diseases. And with the biological factors, uh, we understand that the videos with the TBDM have uh, poor treatment outcomes. Uh, some of the reasons include the non treatment for expected cellular drug situations, the absorptions. Distribution and metabolism of the anti TB drugs are supporting. And with that, we um, designed a research strategy to try to establish a contemporary adaptive disease uh, program in our country, considering some of the programmatic, uh, trying to address some of the programmatic uh, factors we have. The intention here is to integrate. TBDM, and we put some two drivers. One is related to training of the healthcare providers, call it step of training approach, to the custody training, and we incorporated an e learning uh, component. And the other one was uh, a learning system, which we put with all its one of the components also in the same research. In front of the implementation of that uh, model, we uh, in this we selected three regions, the national region of Manjaro. We thought to examine the healthcare delivery system um, readiness. And we examined at the PHC and the regional, meaning that health center, district hospital, and the regional regional hospitals. We wanted to see the level of uh, training of patients on the PDM. Ability to monitor safety. Uh, TBDM, TB is a non disease, EM is a non disease, but the combination is not all. So, issues of safety, it was important to understand that healthcare providers are knowledgeable about the pharmacovigilance and the other factors uh, to integrate the diagnosis and the clinical management of both conditions. And this was our theoretical framework. Uh, the goal here is to interpret the EDM, but there are various gaps which we established. Uh, that the, the gap is in, uh, in the preparation of patients with the TBDM. There are several gaps. It's the figure we uh, is not very clear, but generally, what we learned is that the clinical standards are on form, and there is negligence uh, in clinics. And all these factors we designed the uh, the, the um, changes, our theory of change actually is considering what we have observed in the clinics. And we were some of the important things we engaged medical specialists and the nurse officers to come to these things. We modified because these things are already in the medical program. So we wanted to modify it. Me, my friend, so that other people, other senior people can engage in the, in the process. So, uh, expecting to have short outcomes and intermediate outcomes with the long term outcome is to increase the number of appropriate to by direction of the EDM and the other things to be. So, finally, it's, this is a its assessment. Uh, we see the distribution of the facilities. Uh, this is Iringa. Sorry, this is a regional hospital. 
we consider not to be eligible for the hospital. I know in the recent there are three district one, and uh, these two hospitals they were around eight, and the health centers were seventeen. Now the situation of the patients, you see, is red bars. These are the patients. The patients are largely concentrated on the referral hospitals, whereas TB patients are still at the head centers. So uh, if we have put services at the PHC, we need to make uh, TB patients access head centers and the current situation. And uh, we found some gaps. Uh, the government for TBK was not present at all levels. And also some diagnostics uh, for, for mm -hmm. DM, like it was not available. Uh, very few people except for one digital referral hospital the equipment for T1 AC. But also wanted to see if they were able to measure renal and renal function test was someone with TBDM we need to monitor. Uh, it's also for the medications, insulin was also uh, uh, not available. But for the TB diagnosis and the medicines we are available. Uh, findings of the model. Uh, we need the stepwise training, we selected 46 uh, care providers, 23 were doctors, 23 were nurses, and these people were supposed to do online uh, training, and if they passed, we were invited for workshop. But then we see here, uh, six didn't go through the online training, so only a quarter. Uh, which is 87%, we were able to attend the workshop. But then, uh, after the workshop, we were given the task to go and take the leadership of the integration of the TBDM at their respective facilities, but also support the uh, facilities to do the same. And we noted that there are some individuals who attended the training, but they were actually some of them went to hospital with training, and others didn't. We are doing some endeavors. So we remain with the 32 who we are doing the task now. And we see that shame the, 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 the thing. And I know you, you are not seeing these details, but these are the tools we use to assess for the nurses, specifically because they were supposed to do this in process for the medical doctors and also for the facility. And because those trainees, they, they were supposed to go and empower others. Uh, when we followed it, we um, found that less officers were able to empower around the least 71 nurses, and the team really would not just empower more than one to eight clinicians. And the ratio was that one nurse was able to ask the training with one nurses, and one doctor was able to ask it to be led in. And when we get to see the acceptability of the process, we found that almost 95% of these people accepted the, 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 the process, the stepwise training approach, and 25% were dissatisfied. And the reason that the second level of training happened at the facility. And they found that perhaps they were busy. And using those zero tools, which were some of very busy, we assessed the score. And we found that there was no difference in score among facilities in different regions, except for the nurses who are considering that they outperform the other regions. That's generally things we not the same. And we wanted to, to, to know the fidelity using the clinical audit tool that were they able to screen uh, uh, TB patients who were they screened for DM and vice versa. 
et il pense que ça pense que je suis au travail, il va faire chier des manières très chères. Et du coup, pour une question, je vais faire des choses, 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 et je vais faire des choses. Les détours, 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 les et nous nous comparons les facilités que nous avons implémentées à l'autre. Généralement, le screening de l'in screening de l'ITV a été fait très bien avec les sites que nous avons involvés, qui nous ont implémentées à l'autre comparé au contrôle. Mais il existe des facilités que nous avons travaillé à des conditions comme la hypertension et la malnutrition. And the reason that we supply them with the in this equipment, the comment and the postures. We did it provide them with blood pressure regions. And another thing is that the TV screening in here is also they did it very well. And use of which you and me see. It was done in the facilities which were implementing added compared to those which were not included in added one. Assessment of the complications and the other things, there were actually almost no major difference. But generally, pertaining to this standard, the total score, the added information facilities were really great compared to. Uh, but here we screen the patients, and we were able to, to examine the characteristics of the patients, and we wanted to suppose a uh, supplying documents are in all details, it's not easy. So we wanted to lay uh, markers for prioritizing whom should we screen. It uh, violated this to show the general prevalence of T here with TB, you can see it's around 8% and it's similar to what you did then. But now with the clinical demographic markers, age was relevant. And we were able to establish the type of point that anyone with TB at the age of 35 years old should be screened for DM. Not everyone, at least the age of 35 years old. This is the message. And generally, we have seen that this sequence training will improve the quality of service. This we have demonstrated by the lack of difference in the treatment outcome. There is a slide which perhaps I've skipped. We say that in one time we found that death was five only, but here, um, in, in this study, the mortality, there was no difference in mortality at the age of TB treatment in those with the TBDM and those without the TBDM, showing that all these quality and treatment processes can be improved in the right way. That is the lesson. So, uh, conclusion here is that this is the first training model. Put the quality of census, and then we found that there was no difference in mortality in videos with the TV, TVM and those without TVM. And the clinical audits created some contaminated analysis, and if we deploy it frequently, uh, we actually increase the pressure of the quality of census
So our next speaker is Miguel uh, Mastro Sestera for that, and uh, we're going to prepare the short report. He's from me in Marsa, and uh, I think that Marsa is a global communication and looking at the same way that it's another thing. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. So, on my own behalf, and on behalf of the team in March, I'd like to thank the organizers of this symposium for inviting us to speak at this very important symposium. So, the right what I'm going to present today is a collaboration of many institutions and the real people for the future. We are going to acknowledge them at the end of the presentation. But this are uh, supported by a very able team. Uh, that is shown in this case by me as a way of acknowledging that. Uh, uh, studies in high income countries have shown that uh, individuals that are infected with HIV have a high risk of developing NCDs, including diabetes. And some of the studies have actually shown that uh, the risk doubles. If you have HIV, I mean, there could be many reasons, and people think that or inform that this could be attributed to uh, the effect of using accurate viral therapy, uh, the inf inflammation and the immune activation, uh, immune activation that is common in individuals who are infected with HIV, but the body composition changes occurring in recovery after people start using ART, and also behavioral risk factors. Uh, but on top of that, you know that people who are HIV infected, they also have a higher uh, prevalence of traditional risk factors, including having physical inactivity, uh, high prevalence of tobacco use, unhealthful uh, diet, and even harmful use of alcohol. Uh, in an attempt to understand what is happening in terms of risk of there uh, have been some HIV infected individuals. Uh, people have tried to do some work. This group conducted a meta analysis, uh, trying to understand the, or to uh, reveal the instance and prevalence of type 2 diabetes related to the HIV infection in Africa. And the, the group found that. Uh, uh, there was no evidence of higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes in HIV infected patients versus controls, or those on ART versus those on, on ART. I, however, he made several notes. One was there were very few uh, studies, and those studies were small studies. And they also found that uh, those studies used different diagnostic criteria, and they suggested that uh, there was a need for further studies to examine the relationship. And this study was only published recently. I mean, 2017 is very recent for major changes to the family. So it was based on this situation that in 2016, um, we got some money from the Nations of Foreign Affairs and they established a cohort uh, to prospect the study uh, how diabetes occurs in HIV infection in affected individuals. And in this cohort studies, at the baseline, we included people who were HIV infected with ART, those were about 956 participants, and individuals who are HIV infected but have been on ART for the medium duration of five years, and this were uh, about 655. And of course, we also included people who were not HIV infected. Of course, to understand what is happening in HIV people, we needed to include uh, HIV controls. So, the objective of this study was to determine the prevalence and incidence of pre diabetes and diabetes among HIV infected, but to assess risk factors for pre diabetes and diabetes among HIV infected. But we also wanted to do a little bit more to understand the mechanisms. And this included persistent HIV and ART, the risk of diabetes and complications in our diseases, and to assess if the chronic immune application in adipositive increased the risk of pre diabetes and diabetes 
among the Chinese patients, but you also have to go further and characterize tissue resistance and beta cell function and how these relate to uh, the, the pre-diabetes and the diabetes among people who are HIV. I always wanted to know if people with diabetes with tissue resistance or is due to beta cell dysfunction or is it due to, uh, it, uh, to both. Uh, so we collected data on conventional insulin structures, so, so and as well as the HIV-related markers, CD4 count, CRP, is part of information and the lipids. But we diagnosed that the diabetes using fasting and glucose or glucose process and H1C, but we collected the samples uh, for process this is so that we could calibrate measures of tissue resistance as well as the uh, cell function. Uh, for this symposium, I'm going to share with you uh, uh, some of our baseline data, and those will be based on the prevalence of pre-diabetes and diabetes, uh, based on all these h one c and the risk factors for pre-diabetes and diabetes, as well as that on the role of insulin resistance and beta cell function on the relationship with diabetes and diabetes. So this first table that shows the demographic background of the response function period, which shows uh, uh, what I'm going to yes. So uh, looking at the factors that we have examined. Uh, you can see that uh, among individuals who are HIV were HIV uninfected, as well as those who were HIV infected, but yet on ART, the prevalence of uh, eating fruit or vegetables at the rate of at the level that many of the show, which is five savings or more a day, was really only around 10 percent, 11 percent. However, it was those who were very active, but the level, I mean, the, the rate or the prevalence were slightly higher, but it was only 20%. So, generally, uh, people don't eat fruits and vegetables. Uh, this is recommended by that in show. But uh, uh, we also looked at uh, the other thing that is important here is the level of physical activity. Overall, you see that. Uh, Say about uh, uh, 85 plus of the participants an adequate level of physical activity. That is good, but in this data was reported and not completely correctly. In a subset, in a subset of participants who collected the physical activity data using objective measurements, we have to inform that uh, people who are infected with HIV have very low levels of the physical activity. We also looked at uh, things like the uh, body mass index, and the, as you can see, the level of malnutrition was very high, not only among people who uh, have not yet started ART, but even those, those who have been on ART for at least five years, indicating that malnutrition is still a problem in the individuals who are on ART. Uh, the other slide shows the data that we have on the prevalence of pre-diabetes and diabetes uh, uh, using all DT and H1C tests. And the, uh, the prevalence of diabetes using H1C was 9.3% for HIV infected individual. And 17.7% on those who were HIV infected but not yet to ART. And surprisingly, among individuals who had started ART, the prevalence was only 7.8%. Uh, using OGT as a measure of diagnosing diabetes, the prevalence was 4% among individuals who were HIV uninfected, and 9.1% among individuals who were HIV infected, but who uh, were not yet started ART, but it was down to 3.3%. Maybe that would be the survival bias, but uh, those people who were sick are dying of 
We use the machinomial regression analysis to look at factors that are associated with the diabetes and diabetes in this population. And you will be able to see, we found that uh, if you were HIV infected and had not yet started ART, your risk of being diagnosed with diabetes was like two times. And the, if you have CD4 count of less than 200, also your risk was higher, about or close to twice. But it is important to mention here that uh, also that uh, the impact or the effect on physical activity. And we found that those who were doing adequate physical activities based on WHO recommendation, their risk of having of being diagnosed with uh, diabetes was down by almost 50%. We also looked at the same relationship using uh, OG, uh, diabetes diagnosis, OGT, and also uh, the result that we, we see tend to mirror those vaccines in the soil using HDMC, that is, the risk of diabetes increases if you actually infected with OGT, ART. And of course, if you do any physical activity, your risk of going down with diabetes grows down by almost more than 50%. Uh, I'd like also to share this uh, table, which is uh, based on the standard most done at the center. And the data that I have presented in diabetes. Uh, all the looked at the diabetes is in all of the hospital space. But uh, this study used the fasting by glucose as the basis for diagnosing diabetes among patients who had used the ART for the duration of at least 10 years at the pandemic center. The study is submitted for publication, and it is this study very important that. Uh, Point eight percent or close to nineteen percent. You have to be based on fasting. You are suggesting that diabetes is a problem not only among individuals who are for the ART, but among even among those who are on ART. This is as near as those that have already been published by the colleague of Uganda, which is. I also shown that around 15% of individuals who are active. This is uh, a last slide, I think. In this analysis, we perform that uh, uh, OMAS index, which is reported by one of the that is the risk of diabetes, was not associated with diabetes in our population. So we wanted to for the investment, what could be uh, driving the diabetes in the population? So we were able to calculate measures of insulin resistance and fitness and dysfunction uh, using the former car and insulin daily limits. And based on those two measures, we were able to categorize individuals in four groups those who are normal, those who have isolated fitness and dysfunction. Those who are isolated tissue resistance and those who have also inside structure tissue resistance. And then we looked at how different factors predicted uh, uh, We looked at how these other factors predicted in pre diabetes. And it's important. We also calculated what we call uh, population activity fraction, uh, simply uh, taken. How much of the diabetes is due to either uh, insulin dysfunction or uh, insulin resistance? And I have like to this uh, that but I think that's very important. Uh, looking at these two figures, you can see that uh, 
in our population about uh, 30 percent, 31 percent of our population has diabetes and has a high level of what we call isolated with the dysfunction. While it is only about 10 percent of the diabetes that can be attributed only to isolated insulin resistance, suggesting that. Uh, Isolated in the same dysfunction is an important driver of diabetes in our population than probably previous research. Because previously, people think that all the diabetes will be driven by insulin resistance. So, in conclusion, prevalence of diabetes among HIV infected persons uh, was higher than HIV. Uh, Uninfected persons, suggesting that we need people who may have sense to something to improve the big senses in the ARTDs, but also for both HIV infection and ARTD, a very different role in the history of development. That if one high level of physical activity was strongly associated with reduced risk of diabetes. And in a sense, function is an important determinant of the history of our setting. Lastly, the recommendation is physical activity should be included as part of treatment pattern in the things alongside other lifestyle changes that we need to promote. But we need further studies that characterize the dysfunction in order to help optimize the treatment. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, yeah, so my name is Ali Tinga. It's a great honor for me to um, provide some few highlights in relation to the study that we conducted with regards to the views of the participants in patients with say two diabetes in relation to the challenges that they experience in managing their type 2 diabetes during COVID-19. Um, first of all, I'd like to really thank the organizers for providing me this opportunity to share with you our preliminary findings. So I'm trained in medical sociology and I'm working with the Health Institute in the social science. Um, just to start with, So this study is being funded by MRC, and we have two partners. Ifakara is the leading organization. We have APHRC from Kenya, and we have University of Plus. Uh, just to provide a, an outline of my presentation, I'll touch base on the context of the study, then I'll present the framework, design and methods, findings, and reflection. So just to provide a bit of context, we all understand that COVID-19 image is a very devastating um, pandemic with a lot of healthy social, economic, and mental distress around the world. Unfortunately, at the onset of the pandemic, most of the healthcare uh, systems were not able to respond effectively to the pandemic, I think, due to the upside of the pandemic itself, and because it was an emergency um, situation. And the people with chronic illness, including those with type 2 diabetes, um, have been very much vulnerable to the pandemic because they are more likely to develop complications in case if they contract uh, the infection. So understanding the stories of these patients, especially in relation to how we manage their 
disease during COVID-19. I think it's very important because it's going to provide us with information on some of the key components within the healthcare system and the social system um, that need to be strengthened so that at least we are able to cope with the upcoming disease outbreak. So our line of inquiry is informed by the WHO social determinants of health infirmity, which acknowledge various domains that contribute to the health outcome. And these actually include um, the structural aspects, things like the policy, um, gender, cultural issues, and we also issues related to social, and this includes issues like education, ethnicity, and other ways. We also have issues at the individual level, which also include psychological factors. And it's acknowledged that the health system is a domain that starts across. So our main study um, has five work packages. And what I'm going to present now um, fits within the first work package, which is to understand the personal experience of the patient with the two diabetes with regards to how they manage their illness during the pandemic. And within this um, work package one, we have two main objectives. One is what I've just um, mentioned, and another one is to understand how this patient's scope with the challenges of managing their diabetes during pandemic. So this was a qualitative um, phenomenological study. We wanted to understand the views of the patient with regards to how they manage their illness during pandemic. We collected data from March to April 2021 uh, in the rest of 22, sorry. And this study in Tanzania was conducted in Dar es Salaam and the Morogoro regions, and in Kenya, it was conducted in Nairobi and in Yeri. We wanted to provide some sort of differences in relation to the context between um, urban and the rural aspect. So a face-to-face -face in -depth interviews was conducted in Tanzania, and we conducted online IDIs in Kenya because of the elections that are ongoing. It wasn't that much friendly to conduct face-to-face -face interviews with the patient and also getting the support of the healthcare providers at the health facilities. And the, at least in Tanzania, we were able to conduct the face-to-face -face, um, interviews. Participants were recruited from the government and the private health facilities, and purposeful sampling was uh, employed at least to identify the patient um, who have type 2 uh, diabetes of age 18 and above, and we were able to arrive at a sample size of 38 in Tanzania and 22 in Kenya. Healthcare providers at the health facilities assisted in the recruitment of the study participants. The multi content analysis was uh, employed to identify the key things that emerged um, from the data. So, in relation to the findings, I would like to share with you um, this team model. And we are still in the process of doing the data mining, trying to understand the data. But what we have come up with um, reflected two main domains. And one domain of the themes belongs to the primary level challenges and the general outcome level challenges. And the, within the primary level challenges, as you can see, um, the common discourses from the participants from Tanzania relates to the closure of diabetic clinics during pandemic. So this created some problems for the patient to access their routine health care. And another common discourse that emerged under primary level challenge in Tanzania, it was about business instability leading to financial difficulties. Um, these patients complained a lot about having experienced business instability because they are not able to engage freely with other people and also to conduct their business as usual. 
And why this was the case, why we knew that in Tanzania we did not employ very strict measures. According to different stories from the participants, they say they knew that they were very much vulnerable of contracting um, COVID-19 because of their diabetic status. And they said it is the healthcare providers who kept on warning them that look here, you are vulnerable, so you need to take care. So that created a fear of them to engage as they used to engage in their business. So another discourse that was very common um, under the primary level challenge, it was about mental health distress. Um, and the participants mentioned a lot about feeling stressed, feeling they felt lonely, and also stressed, and because they are also very much scared of leaving their family behind because they knew that we are very vulnerable of developing complications. So they, they, were, they kept on saying that, I knew I'm very vulnerable, so what would happen if I leave my children, if I leave my relatives? So from Kenya's side, um, some of the main discourse that we made is about the price in inflation. They complained a lot about the price inflation, especially for diabetic testing kits and medicine. They also mentioned about unavailability of free medicine and the price inflation of public transport. They also complained about the lockdown and curfew. All these contributed to some of the general um, level outcome challenges, as you can see there. So we were also able to capture some similar schemes from both countries. This is where the views of the participants converge. And we, we saw that both participants from Kenya and Tanzania, they reported about the ability to afford health insurance, health insurance not able to cover a wide range of diabetic services. And some of the participants were actually saying, um, we are very much relying on health insurance. And this is the time that we needed health insurance most, mostly, especially during COVID. But uh, they are experiencing challenges in accessing healthcare through health insurance. They also talked about the fear of social interaction in, in avoidance of COVID 19 and also suffering from COVID 19. So, from the general outcome level challenges, intuitively, what we see here is that uh, the primary level challenges uh, somehow relate or maybe contributing to the outcome level challenges. And uh, here we found that uh, there is difficulty in accessing diabetic medicine. This was a common discourse among all the participants. And in compliance with diabetic medicine, missing doors, failure to get diabetic medicine on time, fear of attending the health facilities for routine check, difficulties in accessing recommended diet, and controlled blood sugar and the catastrophic expenditure. These were the outcome level um, um, challenges that were reported by the participants. And one story that is emerging at this level of, of analysis is that uh, although um, Kenya and Tanzania will share similar outcome level challenges, but the first ways in which these outcome level challenges, the way they are emerging, can be somehow different. So just to provide a bit of context from participants' narratives in relation to the themes that have just presented, I thought it is important for me just to highlight quickly. I won't read everything for the interest of time, just to provide a bit of story behind what I've just presented. Um, from Tanzania, we can see that one participant was talking about it, not having health insurance and the, um, she was trying to explain that, but now I need to buy medicine and the economic situation isn't that much good with this corona at hand. If I had money, I would buy medicine to take me for two weeks or a month and I would not miss any dollars, but now I can't. Another participant from Tanzania was talking about uh, having CHF card, but it, um, this participant was not able to access medicine at uh, the pharmacy. 
And he, he was saying that honestly during that time, meaning during COVID, the challenge was the shortage of medicine at the health facility. A participant from Kenya said that I wonder what the benefit of NHIF is to me. It doesn't help me. This is the time that I needed to use this health insurance because he went to the health facilities and he was not able to get the services that he needed at that time. So difficulties in accessing um, health facilities in relation to the closure of the diabetic clinic during COVID-19. Um, one participant, I think this was a very interesting um, story um, for me, saying that after closing the diabetic clinic, they told us to shift to Nazimonia. Unfortunately, we went to Nazimonia and we were told there was no clinic set up yet for diabetic patients. It was a trouble, of course, there were others who said they went to the plant center, but they went to plant center as well, and I was told there was no such diabetic unity. But for those who could afford, they went to the private hospitals and got the same thing. Another participant from Tanzania said that um, this health facility, meaning the place where we were interviewing that participant, was chosen to manage COVID-19. So COVID patients were coming here. Myself, I was avoiding gathering because I'm already affected with diabetes. And I heard that if you are diabetic and if you contract COVID, you will have difficulties in recovering. Therefore, I decided to buy medicine from the pharmacy. I used the past health instruction to manage my diabetic illness, meaning a health instruction from the healthcare providers. This was the same with the participant from uh, Kenya who talked a lot about uh, lockdown, which restricted uh, his mobility to the health facility. So those are more these causes in relation to accessing diabetic medicine. And uh, I'd like to read this um, quote from this participant who mentioned that it reached a point when I did not have medicine to use. Therefore, there are some days that I went without medicine and my blood sugar went up and I started being sick. I could not even go to work because I felt weak because I missed the medicine. So as you can see, most of these participants eat for this. We are mainly talking about missing the dogs or not able, being able to go to the health facilities because of fear and some of them did not have um, health insurance access to health care. The participant from Kenya emphasized a lot about the crisis inflation, and this one is saying that uh, the medicine was not very expensive before COVID, uh, like during the COVID time. Glycomet, sorry, I cannot pronounce this medical technology. Glycomet was, is a, uh, was a 850 milligram is Kenyan shillings 10 per tablet, and the normal log is Kenyan shillings 5, and I take them twice a day. So per day, I use 30 shillings. So I have to take painkiller to manage this disease. So other patients have to take painkillers um, to manage their diabetes disease because they couldn't afford medicine. So some patients also provide their stories about contracting COVID-19, one participant said that my dad, my, my dad has changed um, when I got disease, this COVID-19. Fear raised my blood sugar. For me, I was not breathing properly. My ribs were paining and I could not even sleep. My work was to sit on pillows because when I slept, I felt tightness in my breathing and so forth. So you can see the way you are narrating the experience of contracting COVID-19. So um, other participants also mentioned about the, um, their difficulties in accessing the recommended diet. And one participant said that during time of COVID, it was a bit difficult. Sometimes I found I don't have the food that I was told to be eating. Then I get confused. In that situation, if I get biryani, I eat. When I finish eating, I just drink a lot of water to dilute the rice. <laughs> So they also talk about the mental health disorders 
And what is interesting with this mental health discourses is about the issue of patients with multiple illnesses talking a lot about being distressed because they kept on referring that, you know, I have parents and they have that other thing. I have parents and they have that. Other. So when I think about managing my illness at this time of COVID and also managing ulcers or managing other or numbness. So it is very expensive for me and it is really expensive for me. So participants also mentioned about being stressed, but those participants who had multiple diseases were more likely to explain a lot, talk a lot about it, experiencing mental disorders. So um, I think it's also important to touch base on some of the coping strategies that were used by participants to manage their distress during COVID. And uh, so they mentioned about uh, they were praying, asking God to help them. So you can see the role of the spiritual leader on this, especially providing support uh, at the time of pandemic. They, the, like this one saying, fear affected me because during that time my blood pressure was high. You see, this is a patient with um, diabetes, but also has a blood pressure. Um, so I had have, I have too much cause. Therefore, I was asking God to give me strength. Others talked about helping, um, finding uh, uh, some sort of a support from other relatives and their friends. And others, they also talked about getting advices from their friends. Others, they decided to use herbs to manage their diabetic illness. I think it, Dr. Yeah, you talked about it, uh, the food, the food conditions, and the way people use um, some traditional herbs um, to treat that. So even during COVID, some of your patients, they also use the herbs to treat it um, there. So um, I, I see uh, Professor Kaushiki more or less like uh, trying to stand up, but let me finish by providing <laughs> Uh, some bit of reflection, <laughs> some bit of reflections with regards to these preliminary findings that we have. You know, um, we had COVID, yes, but now what are the key lessons that we draw from the COVID pandemic? So what we have thought is that it is important to strengthen um, the health insurance component. Um, it's also important to make sure that all forms of social protection, including um, mental health services and health insurance, become easily accessible to patients with chronic illness, including those with sex to diabetes, to enable them to attain a good quality of life, even during a um, pandemic. It is also important to provide a clear and a consistent education. And why? Because it, they are going to use this knowledge in the case of disease outbreak. If patients are very much aware of managing their illness, it won't be a problem during pandemic when the healthcare system is in crisis. And it's also important to ensure affordable and accessible treatment and diagnostic services for people with type 2 diabetes. I think we have seen their complaints and their concerns, especially during pandemic. And we also recommend that specific emergency preparedness plans need to be um, established in order to help people with chronic illness access care during times of pandemic and disease outbreak. So I would like to acknowledge all these people. We also have Professor Kaushik as one of our project advisory committee members and the Minister of Health for providing um, permission to conduct this study. Uh, NIMRI and the regional and the district medical officers for supporting this study, Muna, specifically Dr. Pascal Gatlo, for all the views and ideas that provided for this study. We say thank you very much. And the most so to the patients who provided their precious time, regardless of their conditions, um, to participate in the, in the interviews as well as the research team. <laughs> Uh, 
by the organizers to close and I think they're going to go forward by more than 20 30 minutes. Uh, I, I would like to, if you have any specific questions, please contact the speakers directly. Uh, we would like to give opportunity to people that if you are here to give their perspectives. And I think we are very not to give them an opportunity. So I would like to uh, Mr.
My name is Patricia Kamra. So um, I had a long of speech. Also, I was, I was going to give you seven minutes, but seven minutes to run right now. <laughs> so uh, in a summary, uh, I'm a multimedia journalist. I'm an editor, a content creation executive at Management Relations Limited. When you look at me, most people don't think I am that bad. Uh, with diabetes, um, I have um, I've went through a lot, so I had a situation. Uh, I've been in the ICU twice in the UK. I've suffered a low blood sugar that I didn't basically. I went crazy for a couple of weeks. Um, I did a lot of PCOS I was told I can try a good happy heart, only in the end to suffer and still be Um then um, I was told if I didn't control my blood sugar, um, I would have gone blind in six months. <laughs> then uh, my skill bed um, led to be stigmatized. And um, yeah, people say that she's diabetic, so why should you have a baby with her or marry her to see? And um, 11 years since I was diagnosed, and um, I'm still here. And I'm still nowhere 100% fully understanding why type 1 diabetes is. So you can imagine, I'm 11 years in, and I don't fully understand it. I am the wrong patient. Professor Kausi Kausi gave a test because he has been treating this since I was a teen when I was diagnosed. And um, it has been a lot. What I would say is that um, when you have type 1 diabetes, most people don't really understand. I didn't understand. In my head, I was like, Okay, I was told I'm having diabetes, so all I knew was going to die because my aunt and my grandfather who had it passed away. And that's really hard and difficult when you're a teenager and you're told you have diabetes. I have a sweet tooth. I love eating sweets, biscuits, etc. And uh, my friends were bringing me oranges, and the doctors were like, no, she cannot eat this. How do you take a teenager from that, thinking that I'm going to die? Then you told them that it's possible to live with diabetes. If somebody told me that 11 years ago when I was diagnosed, I would have said no. But my life changed when I made for this house. He gave me hope. Because at the hospital, the first time they told me, you don't have to eat anything apart from bananas and fish, I was very frustrated. But then Professor Kaushi, after I met him, uh, he said, she's a young child. If she's only going to live off bananas, plantains, and, and fish, all the time, how is she going to grow? And that gave me hope. Um, so many years in, there's still so much I'm still learning, but I came to realize that there's a lot that people don't know about type 1 diabetes. But for the stakeholders, the researchers, the doctors, you have to also think about the emotional part when it comes to your patient, because that's really important. When I go to professor for my visits, my clinics, we speak about a lot of things. He has to ask me, like, so do you have a boyfriend? Is he stressing you? What is happening in your life? That's really important because I won't have to go and meet therapists or go to meet all these other specialists if he can do that for me. And the connection that I have, the professor has really helped me to manage my diabetes because I'll be like, I don't really feel I want to drink. I have to text the professor and be like, I really want to drink. And tell me the truth, it's not more than a half a glass today. And that is how he helps me manage my diabetes. I'm not anywhere close to saying that I'm the perfect patient. I think I'm the most wrong patient ever, but I realize that all teenagers are wrong patients. You know, the emotional, it's like of the party time. So they don't really understand, why are you telling me that I'm going to die or I'm going to, I'm going to go blind? I don't really understand that, I just want to leave. And that's really important that as patients, we should take accountability as we see but also as um, our practitioners, as our doctors, we also have to understand that um, we come from a difficult place. It's hard to understand ourselves, but also to, be, to give us that emotional support to work with. And those who are doing um, their researches, please try to stop sitting on your desk, try to search on the internet like, what is happening. Go there, go to the ground, go to people, try to see the people who commit suicide because they have diabetes. Basically, they don't tell their husbands and wives that I have diabetes. I did, and look, I was stigmatized, and I'm here in the rest of them. The family is educated, so you can imagine in the village how this is. I like being candid. I know most people don't, and uh, I don't have the perfect life, but I'm glad that I can speak for other people. Thank you.
congratulate through my young daughter. I am 40 years in diabetes and now 75. I know people who are younger than you who live up to 107. I come across such people in this society. Isukari Hakileti Namdudu Wala Natarus is your life Thank you. And the way when I took on weight, and my wife was so Thank <laughs> you. 